Did somebody just say yay? <laughs> All right. Well, welcome to the Hillsdale College Documentary Showcase. Give yourselves a huge round of applause for being here. We are so thrilled to have you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Buddy Morehouse, and I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I am the instructor of the documentary filmmaking program here at Hillsdale College. This is the third semester that we've had this program, and tonight you are going to be seeing not only Aliens in the Arb, but you are also going to be seeing a number of short films, each about three minutes long or so, that were done by our students, and every one of them is a story about Hillsdale College. So you are going to you are going to have a, a very exciting night of Hillsdale College history and learning about some faculty members, some current students. You're you're in for a really cool night of Hillsdale College entertainment. Um, but before we get started, there are a few uh, very special guests that I wanted to recognize. the The program here at Hillsdale College started because the chair of the Dow Journalism program here, John Miller, had the idea that he wanted to add a video component to the journalism program here. We already had a wonderful print journalism program. We had a great radio journalism program here. We wanted to add that third leg, the video uh, documentary storytelling uh, component to the journalism program here. So John Miller is the one who came up with the idea that we needed to start this program, start teaching these skills and telling these stories. And John is here tonight. So let's give John a nice big round of applause. John right back there. I also wanted to introduce, uh, as I said, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, I, I make films through a company called Stunt3 Multimedia, and my documentary filmmaking partner is here tonight, and he came and spoke to the students and worked with them on some projects as well. He came in here tonight. Brian Kruger is in the back back there holding things. Let's hear it for Brian. We're also very honored to have with us tonight, he was a longtime chair of the board here at Hillsdale College, and his wife, Bill and Jan Broadbeck, are here. Can we hear it for Bill and Jan? Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, of course, to all of our friends from, uh, from the town of Hillsdale and, of course, all the Hillsdale College students who are here tonight. Um, but as I said, the, the, the program started, we started a year ago. And the idea for the documentary filmmaking program was not only to be able to teach the students the skills that they would need to make documentaries, but also to start capturing these great Hillsdale College stories as documentaries. One of the things that I noticed when I, um, uh, when I started researching it, before I started teaching the course here, that is as amazing a, a tradition as Hillsdale College has, as rich a tradition as this school has, there are so few documentaries out there about Hillsdale College. So one of the goals of our program was to remedy that by telling stories, telling great stories about Hillsdale College. Um, now, every semester, our students make about five or six short videos, short documentaries about Hillsdale, and then we always do one large group project, one large group project. And I brought the posters here for the past projects. So we started a year ago uh, with a story that had been sort of well-known here at Hillsdale College, but no one really knew all the details of it. It was a story that took place back in 1955 with the football team here. Uh, the Hillsdale football team was invited to play in a bowl game in Orlando, Florida called the Tangerine Bowl. Um, but the Tangerine Bowl had a policy in place that said that you could not have any race mixing in athletic events there. So they said, Hillsdale, you're invited to come play here, but there were four black players on the team. They said, you need to leave your black players home. They're, they're not going to be allowed to play. And the Hillsdale College players are the ones who made the decision that if we can't all go, then none of us are going to go. So this amazing story that, that this school's mission of being a, a place of equality, that where all students are treated the same, uh, a, a story that really showed that those weren't just words, that was actually the mission of that college. So the 1955 Tangerine Bowl story um, had been sort of well known, but it was never really fully told before until our students made a documentary called A Better Kind of Glory that we premiered a year ago. There were six students in that class, Stefan Kleinhens, Reagan Meyer, Emma Cummins, Elizabeth Bachman, Carmel Kukaji, and Paul Tinkle. And uh, five of them have graduated, moved on, but we do have one of the filmmakers who is with us here tonight, and that's Paul Tinkle. Where are you at? Paul's right over there. Let's give Paul a nice round of applause. 
Paul and his classmates did an incredible job on this film. This one is available if you haven't had the opportunity yet to see it. Just go on YouTube and Google a better kind of, uh, not Google, and search for a better kind of glory, and the film will pop up, and you'll be able to watch that. Great documentary. Then the next semester, in the fall semester of this school year, our students did a film on Hillsdale's incredibly rich legacy um, involving the Civil War. Um, the idea behind this film was that, that uh, people walk past that memorial, the Civil War memorial, every day on campus and don't really fully know the story of Hillsdale's involvement in the Civil War. And it's a truly extraordinary story. So last semester, our students took on the task of telling that story in a documentary, and they decided to do it by telling the story through the eyes of four students at Hillsdale College who served in the war. And they made a film that's called Defending Liberty, Hillsdale College, the story of Hillsdale College in the Civil War. This one's also available on YouTube. Just type in Defending Liberty, Hillsdale College, and it'll pop up there. And this film, I'm very proud to say, last week won an award. The Michigan Student Broadcast Awards were announced last week. Dozens of colleges and universities with these big documentary programs that have been going on for years. And Hillsdale College and our film, Defending Liberty, placed in the top three of that. So let's give them a big round of applause. We're so proud of that fact. The four students who made this film are Reagan Gensajewski, Lily McHale, Gabs Bissett, and Carter McNish. And I know at least Carter is here. Carter, where are you at? Where's, there's Carter right there. Let's give Carter a nice big round of applause. Are any of the other students here? I know Lily's going to be here in just a little bit. So anyway, well, after the... Um, after the, the, the showcase tonight, if you have any questions about any of the past product, projects, Carter or Paul would be more than happy to talk to you about that. And any of you current students who want to know how cool it is to take this class, you can talk to them or any of these students as well. I'll be happy to let you know how, how fun it is and how cool it is to take this class. So without any further ado now, we are now going to watch some of the solo films that our students have done. We're going to bring them up here one at a time, and I'm going to introduce each filmmaker, and then she's going to introduce her film. So our first student filmmaker tonight, would you please welcome Elizabeth Johnson. Let's hear it for Elizabeth. Um, hello. <laughs> hello, my name is Elizabeth Johnson. Um, in a documentary that I'm going to show tonight, um, it was for our, one of our student profile assignments, and so um, we had to interview at least two Hillsdale College students, and so I chose to interview my friends Eva and Claire, um, and they shared their experiences about studying abroad in Austria. So this is my documentary called How to Study Abroad in Austria. I studied abroad in Garming, Austria for, it was supposed to be my spring semester, sophomore year, but because of COVID it got cut short. So in total, I think it was like six weeks. My time in Austria was really amazing. We were living in an old Carthusian monastery in the foothills of the Alps in Austria, which is one of the most beautiful places I'd ever been in my life. So it was amazing to wake up every morning and realize that I lived there. There's another program that's an international students program. So there were people from all over um, the world coming to learn English and theology and so I got to meet some people from Russia, from Eastern Europe, from China and so it was fun just meeting them and getting to know them and helping them learn English and yeah. We also had the weekends free to go on some trips so even though we had to leave early for COVID we got to do a lot of exploring and just really absorb the beautiful place that we were in. It was so so great so we had a four-day week and we'd have classes in the afternoons um, so in the mornings I would just go, go on a hike and then go to mass and then study in the afternoon. And then on Friday we would go on trips for the weekends. Um, I loved our school's trip to Vienna because Vienna is just one of the most beautiful cities I've ever seen. It just had so many 
it's just a gorgeous with this ar architecture and <laughs> has a lot of beautiful art and culture. I also loved Hallstatt, which was a weekend trip that I did later in the semester, which is a mountain. It's just a beautiful mountain town in Austria, but it's famous literally for being beautiful. And it's by this huge lake. And while we were there, we went snowshoeing in the Alps, which was one of my favorite things. I was fascinated with just the culture of Europe in general. And I, my mission was to go to as many um, capitals of different countries that I could. So I went to Vienna and then I also went to Salzburg. I loved both of those, but Vienna, and then I went to Berlin, I went to Dublin, I went to Budapest, um, I went to Prague. Um, so I just, I, every weekend I was like, all right, I'm gonna compare all these. So in Vienna, I got to see the opera and I got to see the Berlin Wall. Dublin, we went to some pubs. I got to see some of the best, like most famous pubs. So I just enjoyed uh, comparing the different cultures in each city. It's your time to adventure, and so just go. If a trip comes up, just say, okay, let's go. I'm usually one who says like, no, I'm, I'm good. But when I was in Austria, I was so, I was just pushing my comfort zone all the time. Did you ever go back? A hundred percent. I wish I could go back right now. It's so beautiful. I'm hoping if I ever am traveling in Europe, I'll definitely stop by. Okay, now we are going to get historical, learn a fascinating story about Hillsdale's history. Please welcome our next student filmmaker, Marianne Powers. Hello. I'm Marianne Powers. Um, my film is about Frederick Douglass. I was inspired to make this film when I was walking through campus and, well, every day walking through campus and um, seeing the Frederick Douglass statue. And I knew that he visited Hillsdale College, but I didn't know much about that story. So I decided to do research and um, found an interesting story. And the title of my film is called uh, History Rediscovered. Frederick Douglass. Thank you. On January 21st, 1863, Frederick Douglass, invited by the Ladies Literary Society, delivered a speech at the Hillsdale College Chapel titled, Popular Error and Unpopular Truth. Though there are no existing transcriptions of the speech, his visit became a treasured part of the college's abolitionist legacy. In 2013, Dr. Arn commented on the speech in a Collegian article, saying, it's another piece of evidence that Hillsdale was an abolitionist college. He continued, Hillsdale is an anti-slavery college on both Christian and political levels. While Douglass' speech in 1863 was widely known and cherished, his return to Hillsdale on September 27, 1888, was unknown to most until 2013, when student Sally Nelson reported on the discovery in her Collegian article, titled, Douglass's Second Visit Discovered. An announcement about this visit was found in the 1888 student newspaper, at the time called the Hillsdale College Herald. The article read, Frederick Douglass, the noted colored orator, will deliver a Republican address at the rink this afternoon. Frederick Douglass's second visit was a part of his campaign trail for Republican presidential candidate Benjamin Harrison. He gathered a crowd of over 400 at the Hillsdale roller skating rink. According to the article, Arlen Gilbert, a retired history professor who wrote several books on Hillsdale College history, confirmed that he too had not heard of the second visit until then. Nelson concluded her article with Dr. Arne's plan to erect a statue of Frederick Douglass as part of the Liberty Walk in the near future. This was an addition that had been discussed since the beginning of the Liberty Walk project in 2002. 
the statue was installed just four years later, on May 12, 2017, beginning that year's commencement weekend with a Friday afternoon dedication ceremony. President Larry Arn, along with sculptor Bruce Wolfe and benefactor James Nagy, unveiled the statue before a crowd of several hundred gathered in the Kresge Plaza on the front of campus. Dr. Lucas Morell, a professor of politics at the Washington and Lee University, delivered the dedicatory address. He began his speech noting Douglas's most famous photograph was taken in Hillsdale just weeks after President Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation. He then concluded his speech saying, in future days, may those who look upon this statue see in Frederick Douglass a full-length portrait of themselves and be reminded what it is to be an American. I did not make Mary Ann put my name at the end of that film. Did I? No, I didn't. Um, great job. Now we know the story of uh, the first time ever told in a documentary of Frederick Douglass's second visit to Hillsdale College. Uh, okay, we learned a little bit of history. Now we're going to have a little bit of fun with a student story. Please welcome our next filmmaker, Phoebe Van Hanigan. Phoebe! Hello, I'm Phoebe, um, and so this assignment was to find an interesting little story about a Hillsdale student. Um, so this is a student profile on Stephen, um, and it has a moral, and that moral is always remember the length of your skis, and that is the title. I have been skiing five times in my life, I think. My first three times skiing, I was a kid, I was at a mountain in Wisconsin, and I did the, you know, the green circles. That was my only experience with skiing. So I'm, I go to Switzerland, um, and they're like, yeah, we go skiing, like every other weekend, basically. So the first time I went, um, it was in Villar, and it was a big group, it was a, it was a big group. And I was inexperienced, like totally inexperienced. Now I, here I am in these huge Swiss mountains in a country where I don't speak the language. I learned like the, the little like shh, shh, shh that you're actually supposed to do in skiing. And once I learned that, I was like, oh my gosh, it's like, I can do this. Like I can go down cool hills. Like I can go down these mountains. Second time I went skiing, I went with four people. We get to the slopes, and this one was called Verbier, um, and it's also known as the Four Valleys. I was easily the least experienced, um, but I had gone once, and I I, I killed it, uh, you know. And so I was I had a lot of confidence in this time. Um, so we get to the peak, and uh, I get my skis, and he's like he's like Are you experienced or not? And I was like, Well, I kind of killed it last time I went, so I'm like intermediate. And so he was like, okay, um, gave me these long skis. They're harder to maneuver, but you get more speed. Uh, it's kind of the trade-off. And the harder to maneuver part really, really came into play. I am not joking, I fell over every single time I tried to turn, every single time, and I was, devastated, like heartbroken, because the last time I went, it was so great. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? Like what happened between Villar and Verbier that is just not fitting in my mind? I was like, I think these skis are too long. And I'm like, I'm gonna rest for a little bit and then I'm gonna go address this with the ski guy. I go to the rental place and it's like, I'm falling over. And he's like, oh, they're, you know, they're too long. And I was like, yeah. 
you know, like, okay, I'm right. And so we go to 163 centimeters, 163, which is like, I was like, that sounds about right. Like from last time I go back out there and I'm not joking. It was night and day. It was night and day. It was like, I just, I, I've never felt more catharsis in my life because I was able to do the things that I had done last time. Um, and I, the the slopes uh, um, that we did after that, like the runs that we did post me getting the the um, the good skis were so cool. It was an amazing day and a huge turnaround. It started off really bad, ended really well. Um, and I'll always remember that dichotomy, um, but yeah. Tomorrow, I'm going to go to Kalamazoo, Michigan. I'm gonna go skiing. Do you think it's gonna be better? I don't know. We'll see. I hope I don't embarrass myself. I know my ski measurements though, and that's the important part, obviously. What are you expecting to use? Not like the Swiss Alps. <laughs> But I think I will. I think I'll appreciate the views because I am a big Midwestern appreciator. Not like Switzerland, a little shorter, um, and so far I haven't fallen over, which means it's not hard enough. But <laughs> it's okay. The skiing with Steven was good. It was a it was a movie. He helped me along pretty well with it, though. I mean, he was like, "Oh, just Max, we're not we're not we're not gonna do any pizzas today. No pizzas, only French fry and slice." Only French fries. So the first time I went down with Steven, we were we went we did the bunny hill. I figured out the bunny hill, tried not to hit any little kids while we were doing that. And then went up to the top of uh, top of the bunny hill instead of just halfway up. And went and then nearly hit a kid, nearly hit Steven, nearly hit Charlie Megan's and yeah. But then we went down the other one. And me and Danny decided to have a race and ran away from Steven. Both of which were accidental because Steven had to actually try to catch us because we didn't know how to stop. Did he help you learn how to stop? No. <laughs> We do documentaries about everything in our class, yes. Let's hear it for Phoebe one more time. Great job, Phoebe. Okay, our next film is a very fascinating story that happened in Hillsdale. Uh, it was, it's kind of been known in the town here, but I believe this is the first time it's ever been done as a documentary. So please welcome our next filmmaker, Anna Bassols. Let's hear it for Anna. Hello. Um, so I'm Anna Basols, and this documentary is something that I found while going through the Vanished Hillsdale Facebook page. There's a lot of great historical information on there that I had never heard about before. Um, I found an old newspaper clipping there, and I thought it was a fascinating story. This is about the Palm Sunday tornadoes. April 1965, Hillsdale, Michigan is struck by a deadly tornado. Among the insurmountable damage, 10 are dead. The tornado cut through town, leaving a wake of devastation in its path. It was one of the worst disasters to befall this rural, sleepy Michigan town, where tornadoes are uncommon. The damage left parts of the town completely unrecognizable. Pictured here is Bob E's. Among those impacted was the Poling family. Mr. and Mrs. Poling were killed, but their children were rescued. The children's grandfather, Pearlie Poling, returned to the scene to try and find his son and his daughter-in-law. In his search, however, he was struck by a falling tree branch and killed. But it was not one tornado that devastated the Poling family. It was two. 
Just when the residents of Hillsdale began to think that the worst was behind them, a second tornado appeared. Like many other Hillsdale residents, their family business was in ruins. Pete Poling recounted the incident as he stood over what remained of the Poling TV service and gas. Major relief organizations, such as the American Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and even the National Guard came to Hillsdale in order to help with the recovery. The governor at the time, George Romney, also paid a visit to Hillsdale. Among those in charge of the recovery operations was William Van Horn, the civil defense director for Hillsdale. He worked hard to ensure that everyone felt that everything was under control. However, the damage was not insignificant. The tornadoes came to be known as the Twin Tornadoes, or more commonly, the Palm Sunday Tornadoes. They were a part of a series of tornadoes that went through six different states, killing 214 people in total. There were plenty of stories like that of the Poling family. One resident, an 80-year-old Mrs. Hugh Norris, had her house completely swept off of its foundations and blown into Bobby's Lake, where she was later rescued. For weeks after the event, the town was left struggling for basic necessities, such as water and electricity. Though Hillsdale has had its fair share of severe weather since, nothing has come quite as close to matching the devastation of the Palm Sunday tornadoes. Hey, thank you, Anna. Um, we have another fascinating historical story, a story for you right now. Uh, this is one that every Hillsdale person needs to know, and would you please welcome now our next student filmmaker, Mira Baldwin. Let's hear for Mira. Hello, everyone. My name is Mira Baldwin, and for this assignment, we all had to make a documentary about the same person. Uh, we did it on, on Will Carlton. You might recognize it from Carlton Road in Hillsdale. And he is a poet, or was a poet. And I really encourage you to just enjoy his poetry and uh, really take his words to heart. Yellow, mellow, ripened days, sheltered in golden coating, or the dreamy, listless haze, white and dainty, cloudlets floating. These were the words written by esteemed American poet and Hillsdale College graduate Will Carleton as he walked the streets of his college town. Will Carleton was born in the country town of Hudson, Michigan, and he's known for providing a literary voice to rural America through his poetry. He was born into a family and community of farmers, and that upbringing greatly influenced his body of literature. When he came to Hillsdale College, he saw the world through the eyes of a farmer. While on campus, Carlton joined the Delta Tau Delta fraternity, and he wrote for the college newspaper, The Collegian. At one point, his highest ambition had been to become a journalist. However, he found his literary footing in poetry and began curating poems for a collection. Some of his most beautiful work he began while at Hillsdale College. On graduation day in 1869, he delivered Rifts in the Clouds, where he said, For life's a cloud, and take it as we will. The changing wind ne'er banishes or lifts. The pangs of grief but make it darker still and happiness is nothing but its rifts. He worked as a journalist in the town of Hillsdale for a handful of years. All the while, he continued writing poetry and sharpening his skills. 
Carlton garnered literary fame outside of Southern Michigan with his narrative poem, Betsy and I Are Out. This poem tells the story of a rural couple and their rise to divorce. Betsy and I Are Out exemplifies Carlton's entire literary body in his way to provide artistry to the mundane and honestly depict all aspects of regular human life. After being published several times by Harper's Bazaar, and after continuing to grow his collection of poetry, he eventually published Farm Ballads. Across this collection of distinctly similar but wholly unique poems, he tells a story. He allows readers to peer into the lives of individuals living in rural America. For instance, he continues the story of Betsy and her farmer husband in the poem How Betsy and I Made Up, where the divorce papers are thrown into the fire and his wife kisses him for the first time in 20 years. The poem ends with the line, I'm richer than a national bank with all its treasures told, for I've got a wife at home now that's worth her weight in gold. Carlton himself married during the height of his literary career. Her name was Anne Goodall, and her influence on his poetry is obvious. Some of Carlton's later poetry reflects upon the life that he and his wife had built together. In the poem, Out of the Old House, Nancy, Will Carlton expresses a wistfulness for the past, but a readiness to move on. After meeting his wife in New York, they eventually moved back to his rural hometown of Hudson, Michigan. However, Will Carlton died in his Brooklyn home. Carlton used his words to reflect the beauty and the pain of American life and he now rightfully finds himself among the poetic greats of this country. Uh, as, as Mira indicated, each of the students in the class were required to do a film about Will Carleton. Uh, one of the things that I'm um, kind of becoming an evangelist for in this class is to make sure that everybody knows the story of Will Carleton. He's probably the most famous graduate that Hillsdale has. As Mira said, there's a road named after him here, there's a school named after him, there's a Will Carleton poorhouse, and yet nobody really knows the story of Will Carleton. So if you do take this class, you are going to know about Will Carleton, correct? Correct, yep. Carter? Yep. Paul, right? Yeah, okay, you're going to know about Will Carleton if you take this class. So thank you for, for um, learning a little bit more about Will Carleton with us. Uh, we have another fascinating story now about a Hillsdale student Please welcome our next filmmaker, Josie Miller. Josie. Hello, everyone. So mine is about a student, as Mr. Morehouse said, um, who I went to high school with. And he has a great story, and I think everyone just needs to hear it. Uh, yeah, I joined the Marine Corps um, in 2018 is when I went to boot camp. I think I was nine when my older brother, Patrick, enlisted in the Marine Corps. And so, I mean, the older brother and like, I was the perfect, nine is the perfect age to be just totally inspired by, I mean, any age is good to be inspired by that, but nine, I mean, um, that really caught me and caught my imagination. Ever since Patrick went in, uh, this has been, uh, a subject in our house, but a subject not just um, of imitating an older brother who is beloved, but in the context of family and faith and loyalty and honor and the virtues that, that I think the Marines have traditionally uh, stood for, Semper Fidelis. So, you know, always faithful. So that kind of planted the seed of the Marine Corps. And out of the blue, I didn't, I didn't see this coming at all. I didn't, I didn't know this was gonna happen, but I got orders um, to 1st Battalion, 8th Marines in May of, I think, 2020. The whole reason I was sent was for this deployment. February of 2021, we got on the ship and we spent a month up and down the American coast. So we weren't technically deployed yet. And then in March, we actually pushed across the Atlantic. It wasn't known that he was going to Afghanistan right away. It was just that he was going to be deployed. And for him, he was so excited. His, his run in the Marines 
was less than what he had expected. Everything was normal there. All that stuff had been planned. Time went on. We ended up stopping in Kuwait. We were put off, um, off the ships in Kuwait for a month before we actually went to Afghanistan. It's not like we could be very disappointed. This was, this was what he wanted to do. He wanted to be in the Marines and help people. I mean, the news was telling more than like I knew at the time. I think it was August 14th, we were told the mission to go, we're actually going. Um, and up until that point, actually, none of us actually expected to go. I think it was like 1 a.m. on the 17th is when we were in the airport. When there was the explosion at the Abbey Gate and the 13 service men and women uh, were killed in the bomb, we did not know. However, Gregory told his buddy, let my parents know that I'm okay. It may have been 24 hours that we waited, but um, you know, you just have to trust to God and, and um, he was doing what he suppo was supposed to do and what he wanted to do. I didn't notice a photo being taken. Um, I was told about it after the fact and it was just kind of like, it was kind of unreal. We were standing on the hood of trucks actually. So the gate opened inward. Um, and so we actually pulled these massive trucks up behind and left, you know, like a foot, foot and a half behind the gate just so they can't be forced open by, by the crowd. We had like 18 to 20 guys down below just to try to push the gate closed. You know, it didn't really mean anything to me at the time because there was so much going on. I said, you know, this picture has gone viral. And he goes, no, somebody just gave it to me and said, this is you. In the particular situation, it was, it was just kind of, it was totally epic. I mean, from the second that we touched down, it was, there's a sense of, it doesn't seem like anybody really knows what's going on. The crowd was, I mean, terrified. I remember that instance. It stood out just because um, my platoon sergeant is the, is the man actually reaching over and grabbing the baby. And it just because he was bending over so far that like that stuck in my head. Because there was a real fear that if he fell in, I mean, he might not get, like, gonna get back up. Uh, I just remember like the baby looked like it was gonna just snap in half. Gregory said, I saw mom and baby and dad all reunited. And we've since heard that they're in Arizona and, and thriving and very grateful. It's kind of just like a restart button. Like I got out of the Marine Corps and like I'm starting here. And I'm just, I'm just gonna figure things out as it comes, kind of see where I'm led and see where, what I'm, what I love and what I'm interested in. I was absolutely glad that I did it. Um, I mean, there's a multitude of reasons why I got out and why I wanted to, and I'm totally at peace about doing that. Um, and I am still very glad that I did it, and I, I needed it. I think I needed a lot of growing up um, before, before I like, come to college and stuff. Some amazing students here at Hillsdale College. Uh, we have another very fascinating student profile now. Please welcome our next filmmaker, Liz Oxall. Liz! Um, this next film is about two very endearing students here, um, the McHales. So I just wanted to, I got to experience having a sibling with me at Hillsdale for one year and I wanted to see what the McHales thought of their own experience having each other at school, so. I'm Lily McHale. I'm a senior studying political economy um, with a Spanish minor. I'm from Westchester, New York. Um, I have a brother at this school as well. He's a sophomore. My name is Finian McHale. I am studying um, vibes. No, but I'm actually studying history. Um, I really love history. It's just kind of unlocks the world. I went to first through eighth grade with my brother. And then we went to different high schools. I went to an all girls Catholic high school and he went to an all boys Catholic high school. Um, I went to an all boys high school uh, my sister did not go there. One of my favorite memories is actually when he visited me when he didn't go here yet. Um, 
he visited me, I think it was my sophomore year, um, and he came to Kyle Formal with one of my friends. It was just a really fun time, like, showing him what Hilda was like and, like, what it, it could be for him. I hung out with uh, my sister's friends, and they were uh, pretty cool, and I could see myself going after meeting those people. Last semester, we didn't really plan anything. It was very much organic. Um, but actually, I did text him the other day that we need to hang out because we haven't seen each other in a while, so that quality time. <laughs> It definitely varies, I think, depending on how busy we both are, but we do have a lot of the same friends, so that is really fun. So if we're hanging out on the weekends, we'll see each other a lot, um, or then I'll run into him in the library or something. Especially at a small college, you get to interact with everyone's friend groups, so you know kind of what they are like in college, and you also know that um, people will recognize you for both your own individual talents, but you can also be part of a, a family. We both just kind of are generally vibing in our circles and our circles overlap. I love having him here. I didn't, so we're two years apart, so I was here for two years before he came. Um, and yeah, at the time I didn't really think that it would make that much of a difference like if he came here or if he went somewhere else. Um, because I just want him to do whatever he wants to do, obviously, but um, now that he's here, it's really fun. I couldn't imagine it any other way. It's been cool to have this experience together, especially because we do um, overlap with a lot of people. It's been very, very cool to be close, um, a lot closer than going to high school and she's in college for two years difference. I feel like we're closer in age now that we're in college more so than we've ever been before. Although it is similar to like grade school where you're in the same grade school, but it is college. So, you know, people's lives are different, but in a good way. It's just fun to still be able to spend time together even though we're in college, because if he was somewhere else, I feel like we wouldn't be as close or we wouldn't be able to see each other as much. Um, so yeah, it's been really fun to just see him experience all the things I did and then do his own thing as well. Having that sibling in college is very helpful and you can, you make the most of it. Oh, there go the McHales, like the, uh, the Renaissance men of New York. Um, you know, that's kind of what they say. All right, Liz. Are the Renaissance men of New York here? They're both here. Let's Lily and Finn. Let's hear it for the Renaissance men of New York. We are honored to have you here. Very cool. Very, very cool. Um, Claire's not here, is she? Oh, okay. One of our filmmakers, unfortunately, was ill today. She is so upset that she can't be here today. Um, but we're going to see her film right now, and it is really, really cool. So the assignment for this film was the students had to do a documentary about either an alumni, or a alumnus, or a faculty member. And Claire Gaudet was actually able to find somebody who was both an alumnus and a faculty member. So this is a film by Claire. Let's give her a nice round of applause so she can hear it. I started in the fall of 2006. I graduated in May of 2010. Um, I visited in the fall of 05, which was fun. Um, it was interesting between when I was a perspective and when I started, they built Lane and Kendall. So <laughs> that was funny upon coming back. The Collegian was a huge part of my um, time on campus. I knew I wanted to go into journalism. Um, we did have the journalism program at the time. It was not a minor at that point. Um, but I started working for the Collegian the first issue my freshman year, like many of my students do now. And um, the first story that I had printed was about a 9-11 memorial, I remember that. Um, and they put it on the front page because it was timely, not because it was well done. 
I love working here. If you'd asked me when I was, you know, a freshman or sophomore, would you want to work for Hillsdale? I would have said no. Why? I want to go out in the world and do something. Um, I was gone for a year after I graduated working as a reporter in Colorado. Um, but then the people who were in charge of the program both left um, that fall of 2010, spring of 2011. And so they said, do you want to come back? And after coming back and interviewing, I thought, this is definitely what I want to do. Yeah, Mrs. Circle's the best. Uh, I got to know her late in my college career just because I didn't go the traditional route with journalism. I took the intro classes way too late. Um, so I got to know her last year, in my junior year, and getting to know her has been a huge blessing. Um, she's incredibly talented at what she does, everything journalism, writing, editing related. Um, she's exceptional at it, and it has been wonderful to learn from her, and I think a lot of um, the reason that her perspective is so valuable is because she was an editor-in-chief and she did the collegian thing, you know, she worked her way up the, uh, the ladder and did all the editing, the late night Wednesday things that we do. I'm seeing lots of people I recognize. That was Saga Steve, who would swipe everyone's cards at the dining hall. Here was when we had an elephant at Central Hallapalooza, I think I told you about that. There's Dr. Arn on an elephant at Central Hallapalooza. <laughs> I think my favorite thing about Hillsdale is just the community that's here. Um, and I would say I would have had the same answer as a student, but sort of in a different way. So as a student, it was, you know, my friends and the classes and, you know, parties you'd go to and sort of you had this, I mean, really just this tight little community. Um, and I still have that, but it's more with, you know, I mean, my friends now, my church community, the city um, and the college as well, but just that sense of like people here together on this sort of shared mission. Um, and so how that, you know, sort of played out as a student and as a faculty member is different, but it's the same sort of drive, I think, that we have. And I think you see that with a lot of the faculty members, especially those who are alumni, um, we sort of carried that love for what we do here into, you know, the work. We would be lost without Mrs. Serval, and I'm immensely grateful for her and her mentorship and our companionship and uh, everything that she's helped us do at the Collegian and in our own lives. So thank you, Mrs. Herbal. All right, is Maria here? Hey, let's have a nice round of applause. Maria's here, all right. Was a strange seeing your life story on the big screen? Very cool. Well, Claire did a great job with it. Thank you for being here, Maria. Uh, we have one more film now that we're going to watch before we get to our feature attraction. And I'm going to let her introduce this because this is a really, really cool story. Please welcome Grace Umland. Grace! Hi, my name is Grace Umland, and since coming to Hillsdale, um, something that's been really significant to my experience has been playing games with my friends. And for my student profile, or I wanted to so showcase um, one of my friends, Nate, who is just amazing with games and his experience with D&D. Thank you. Dungeons and Dragons um, is a part of uh, a larger thing called tabletop role-playing games, which is where one player is the game master, and the game master creates a world and creates a story. And everybody else are what's called player characters, where instead of creating a world, you just create one character with a personality, a background, um, and then the game of Dungeons and Dragons is these characters interacting with the world. There's no winning, there's no losing. It's if the Odyssey was Homer is the game master, deciding the world, establishing a mythos, and then Odysseus, Telemachus, Penelope um, are all players, how they're interacting with the world as it happens. It is a cooperative, think of it as like a play, but there's no it's all improv. It's an improv play where one person is deciding how the rest of the world functions. And tabletop, the tabletop world has always been something that has been a social activity for me first. I, I think the Dungeons and Dragons and being able to engage in that world has been a nice outlet to get to have more friends, basically.
or to further friendships with friends. Yeah, um, when you sit around every Wednesday night and you talk in funny accents for three hours, you tend to bond with people. I, I think Dungeons and Dragons is a is a, a an art form, cooperative storytelling art, and I, I really do think it, it, the word is overused a lot, but I do think art is right there because it's. Uh, it, it, it draws emotion out of people, if you let it. Because being able to step out of yourself and into a character you've designed gives you so much potential for kind of self-discovery and exploration. I've discovered I'm much more competitive than I thought I was. But, um, you know, that, that's not normal for me. So, you know, I'm, I was like, hmm. I had this competitive side I didn't even know existed. Or knew existed, but I didn't know it was so, like, you know, I, I thought I'd buried it long ago. Um, when I am playing Dungeons and Dragons, I will create a, a character that is um, a larger-than-life version of one part of myself. So my, a strength of mine, or a weakness of mine, or a question that I'm currently wrestling with. Like, I made a pacifist character in one Dungeons and Dragons campaign, because I, I didn't know what my thoughts on violence were. And I wanted to wrestle with that in a natural way that let other people influence that, but also wasn't overbearing. So I, I created a character with a specific stance on, on violence, um, and I, I ran with it. And I asked those questions in the game, which then gave me a more sure answer in the real world. And sometimes it's, it's very pleasant that I have to step out of that world for a bit. And I'm able to step into the world of tabletop, of, of Dungeons and Dragons, or of um, furry little critters fighting for a forest kingdom, um, or whatever game we end up playing, that I'm able to, it, it forces me to take a step back, so I'm not overwhelmed by it. Um, it's kept me sane. <laughs> I think that um, Hillsdale is a, can be a harsh journey. So I think it's, it's affected, the tabletop world has, has given me the space that I need to kind of pursue my creative side, away from from the school desk um if you will because it, it's it's allowed me to further friendships create new friends um and take that well-needed breath during busy weeks grace is it nate here let's hear it for nate all right if you want to play Dungeons and Dragons, there's your guy. There's your guy. All right, folks, we have come now to our feature attraction for the evening, Aliens in the Arb. Before we watch the film, though, I just want to let you know a couple things. Number one, hopefully you had an opportunity on the way in here to experience some of the refreshments that we have out there tonight. And if not, when you leave here, we have great cookies that Bon Appetit has brought here. And we also had, if you had a chance to see them, those really cool aliens cake balls. Were those not fantastic? Come on. It's here for the alien cake balls. We go all out here. Yes. Um, we're not going to take any of that stuff home, so especially you students on the way out tonight, take cookies with you, take them back to your friends, take them back to your dorm. Um, Got to get rid of all those tonight. Um, and then after we watch this film, it's about 35 minutes long, Fascinating story you're about to see here. Uh, after we watch this film, we're going to have a little Q&A with the filmmakers. We're going to bring all of them up here. Any questions that you have either about the story or itself or about the process that they went through to make this film, that'll be your opportunity to ask that. So this film that we're going to watch right now is called Aliens in the Arb. And this is another one of those stories, kind of like the Tangerine Bowl story, that has uh, a, lot of, a lot of people in town kind of know the, the, the basics of this story, the 1966 UFO sighting that happened here in Hillsdale College. Um, but uh, this has never been done, in, the Hillsdale one has never been done in a full documentary before. This is the first time it's ever, gonna, uh, it's ever been done as a documentary. And they found some really, really cool information when they were researching this. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here is Aliens in the Arb. So what happened in the Arboretum on March 21st, 1966? The scream echoed down the hall of the second floor east wing of McIntyre dorm. At least that's what Gidget Cohn wrote in the Collegian all those years ago. At least 62 girls saw something that night, but they can't even explain what they saw. Even with all of our research, it's been really difficult to pin down exactly what happened that night. 
There were so many testimonies about what happened in Hillsdale that night, but half of the witnesses still living refused to talk to us. Not to mention the involvement of a future U.S. president. All I'm saying is that when you look at the facts, it seems quite possible that there were aliens in the ARB. On June 24, 1947, Kenneth Arnold, a private pilot, witnessed something unforgettable along his journey through the Yakima River Valley. Looking out into the night sky, he claimed to have seen nine shiny bright objects traveling near Mount Rainier. He calculated them to be moving at up to 1,200 miles per hour. The sighting of what appeared to be something entirely otherworldly erupted in a national fascination of space, aliens, and specifically, unidentified flying objects. Some believed that the objects he saw were extraterrestrial, others that the flying saucers were some military experiment, and even some accused Arnold of insanity. In the weeks following Arnold's sighting, hundreds of people across the country claimed to have similar sightings. Flight 105, the infamous Roswell incident, and numerous other accounts led to the rapid development of conspiracy theories and speculations across the nation. Concerns arose about the Soviet Union's possible involvement in the matter. As reports flooded in, the U.S. Air Force decided to investigate the UFO sightings further. In 1952, Project Blue Book was launched. Its mission was twofold, to evaluate the threat of UFO sightings to national security and to study the scientific implications of the UFO's existence. Made up of a team of both Air Force personnel and scientists, Project Blue Book compiled thousands of UFO reports. However, their conclusions were ambiguous and elusive suggesting around 90% of the sightings could be explained by astronomical or man-made phenomenon. The UFO hysteria continued through the 50s as the Cold War kept heating up. Nobody was spared from the UFO fascination, as talk of space and the extraterrestrial had continued presence in the media, books, movies, and TV shows of the time. By the 60s, Nearly every state had reported some sort of incident involving UFOs, even an alleged abduction in New Hampshire. The frenzy surrounding UFO sightings in the United States came to a head on March 20th, when a UFO was spotted in Dexter, Michigan, just 60 miles from Hillsdale. The saucer mystery of 1966 began here near Dexter, Michigan, late in March. And before the month was out, flying saucers were being reported from New Jersey to California, from Colorado to Long Island, from Ohio to Georgia. On the 20th of March in Dexter, about 8.30 in the evening, Frank Manor, his son Ronald, his wife, and his family had 10 kids. They were having a dinner. It was like after the dinner hours, big family reunion, and Frank, went out because the dogs were howling, because they never howl. So he goes out there and he sees this light, these flashing lights, a singular blob coming down and landing a few hundred yards from the farmhouse that they were living in. Well, uh, first beginning, uh, we were watching television and we have six dogs here and they started raising a fuss in which they never do much. So we, I went outside and give a yell at them and, as I turned around to come back on the porch, I looked to the north of me, and uh, there were, looked like a fallen star radar. It was red and kind of coming down and on a 40, about a 45. And so then I watched it, and I was going to see if it landed, and then maybe go down and see what it was. And uh, when it got to the top of the trees, it stopped, and a, a blue and a white light come on it. And... Uh, I looked at it and I thought I was seeing things. 
And then the hysteria hit Hillsdale. Hillsdale co-ed spot flying saucer, eyewitness account by Gidget Cohn. UFO! The scream echoed down the hall of the second floor east wing of the new women's dorm. It was 10.30, Monday night, March 21st. I ran to my window and there it was, radiating intense silver white light and heading directly for the dorm. A brief flash of lightning illuminated it for just a second, and in that moment I saw what appeared to be a squashed football or basketball. The object nervously darted east, away from us, stopped in mid-air again, and moved in a jerky lateral way, first north, then south, then up and down. It seemed to be frantic. On the evening of March 21st, 1966, the women of McIntyre Dormitory spotted something moving towards them over the treetops of the Arboretum. The first shouts identified the mysterious lights as a UFO, and girls flocked to their windows to catch a glimpse of something they could hardly believe. You know, it uh, moved very rapidly at any speed or rather any direction it wanted to go. Why it could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. Basically, uh, in the air, what it, the hills are great of a, a strange light came into focus and was eventually spotted by several students in the, in the women's dormitory right by there who sort of crowded around windows to, to see what was going on and eventually got the attention of so several of the dorm mothers in there and eventually the, also the civil defense director of Mr. Van Horn who just watched the thing. This, no one was permitted to go out and actually touch it or get close to it except for a local a police officer, Harold Hess, with his partner Jerry Wise, drove up to the, uh, pretty close to the object in the R and sort of watched this great football shaped ball of light pulsate throughout the night and they, they attested to me in an interview I did uh, in 2015 that the object had an electrostatic interference with their police vehicle preventing them from being able to transmit uh, dispatches from them. And so this just, they sort of watched this all happen over the course of the night and eventually it just kind of went up and disappeared after several hours. But it was witnessed and documented by many students. This is Hillsdale and the girls at Hillsdale College had a night to remember. Well, when I was looking out the window with the binoculars, I guess it was about 12, I saw it, and I saw two red lights, and I saw what looked to be shaped like a pie. I could see the front of it, and I just saw the round front, and I could see the lights on either side. And then the red light was sort of casting a glow over the whole thing, so it looked like a round disc. At first, when I'd heard the other girls talk about it, I didn't really... I believed them, yet I couldn't really make myself comprehend it because I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. But then when I saw it, I just was fascinated. I wasn't afraid. I, I just wanted to stay there and keep my eyes glued to it. I couldn't leave. I know I saw it, but, and I, I mean, I know myself I saw it, but I don't, I believe I saw it, but I can't fathom it because it seems so unreal. They called, uh, they called the guy by the name of Bud Van Horn who occupied an office that uh, no longer exists because the Cold War is no longer going. It was, I mean, it was like the civil uh, manager, something like this. William Van Horn, Hillsdale's undertaker and civil defense director, also spotted the UFO and was out with his Geiger counter next day, checking a mysterious perfect circle where the UFO had been seen. Van Horn did not find any radioactivity here. But this did not shake his certainty that he had seen a hovering vehicle with two lights. Many people ask him why he did not go right up to the UFO in the dark. I'd uh, much rather be a live coward than a dead hero. And uh, with the area of uncertainty that we have here, uh, how do I know but what uh, maybe, uh, maybe there's a current, uh, an electrical charge which is being uh, radiated by one of these vehicles which would uh, uh, electrocute you if you got within a certain area of it. There was no sound whatsoever. I could not hear a, uh, a bit of sound. Over the next few days, news of the UFO sighting spread like wildfire. People flocked to Hillsdale to investigate evidence of the extraterrestrial for themselves. 
the Hillsdale College UFO Club was launched, offering UFO rides around Central Hall. Meanwhile, the phone at Bud Van Horn's office was ringing off the hook with calls from reporters and news agencies, begging for an inside scoop. Soon, news of the sighting hit the national stage. CBS reports, UFO, friend, foe, or fantasy. Reported by CBS News correspondent, Walter Cronkite. Good evening. Reports of flying saucers are nothing new. From the beginning of recorded time, men have been seeing unexplainable things in the sky. And there's no reason to doubt they saw something. The question is, was what they saw really there? And what was it they really saw? The sighting at Hillsdale drew significant attention, leading the U.S. Air Force to open an investigation. They needed to put a stop to rumors and get to the bottom of what had happened. They sent in Dr. J. Allen Hynek, an astrophysicist and Project Blue Book consultant for the job. So a guy named J. Allen Hynek, who was known for investigating this kind of thing, Project Blue Book, came to Hillsdale and interviewed people, uh, assessed the site, and he came to a conclusion which became sort of infamous that it was caused by swamp gas, which is a, a sort of natural phenomenon that arises in areas in spring often as they're sort of moving out of the winter thaw. There's kind of decay of gas that occurs and it can cause lights to appear. The government is forced to send their UFO investigator, Dr. J. Allen Hynek. He was a he, he did no science for UFOs. He never did an investigation. He was their debunker. He was, you know, an astronomical consultant, scientific consultant. His job, and he admitted this later in writing in one of his books, his job was to disinterest the public in the whole UFO thing. Famous Dutch astronomer Minert, in his book Light and Color in the Open Air, has this to say about swans. He describes lights that have been seen in swamps by the astronomer Bessel and other excellent observers. The lights, he says, resemble tiny flames, sometimes seen right on the ground, sometimes floating above it. The flames go out in one place and suddenly appear in another, giving the illusion of motion. No heat is felt. The lights do not burn or char the ground. They can appear for hours, this is all a quotation, they appear for hours at a time and sometimes for a whole night. Generally, there is no smell and usually no sound except the popping sound of little explosions, such as when a gas burner ignites. This is precisely what was observed there. I did see the burn spots that were up the hill from the Arab. It was kind of like burned out grass and kind of oval shaped, not necessarily round. Um, but there were, I think there were four of them. I can't remember exactly, three or four which made one believe that it was not swamp gas. <laughs> and then when that report came out that it was swamp gas, the town was again in an uproar. Um, but I'd say the majority didn't believe the report. And he arrives, you have to remember, this is 1966, and uh, the, the small towns in, in, uh, in southern Michigan were much different than they are now. You know, they, they were lively. Uh, and when Heineck arrives in Dexter, there are people crowded all over, you know, the swamp. And, and they're convinced it was aliens. That's what happened. And, you know, as, as Heineck is starting to interview eyewitnesses, this guy steps out of his car, takes a fiddle out of his case, and starts playing it. Uh, and he says later, I was hoping to call the phantom spirits down to Earth. Another guy links a message in Morse code to the aliens, you know, to show themselves. Uh, and so, you know, Heineck, of course, after after seeing this stuff, was understandably pretty skeptical. <laughs> I've had many, many letters pointing out that um, they, as children on the farm, had had many experiences with swamp lights and that this was obviously the thing that it was and they couldn't understand why the people in Michigan got so excited over swamp lights. And the illusion of motion frequently is given by the fact that a little bit of swamp light appears here 
it goes out, another one appears over here, that goes out then, and, but the illusion as viewed from a distance is that the objects have moved back and forth. And sometimes this gas will gather into a ball and actually float away. Dr. Hynek does a press conference at the Detroit Press Club. There were over 60 representatives from the media from all over the country. And he told the world that it was swamp gas. It was the spontaneous combustion of rotting vegetation on the floor of a swamp. But he said it only applied to Dexter and Hillsdale, and he couldn't explain the other ones. He really runs into problems, though, when he comes down to Hillsdale, because there you have a number of eyewitnesses who are all convinced that something, something occurred. And that's where he points his famous term, swamp gas, you know, just waving it all away. If you've been into the ark, there's not much of a swamp there. <laughs> And there wasn't then, and there, and there isn't now. That story of swamp gas went nationwide, went through the world, and it launched that part of our lexicon where we go, that's not a UFO, it's just swamp gas. Not simply take every statement made and give it credence. You have to, to get the least common denominator of these statements. And when you do that, then the, all I, would, I was able to get from them that the lights appear to rise somewhat and descend, not many times, a few times during the course of the evening. Both the Hillsdale girls and the people at Dexter described the glow of the lights behind the trees as though they were, they would get brighter and dimmer, as though stage lights were being turned up with a rheostat, as they do in stage lights. None of them, except those two people, Mr. Manor and his son, no one else described an object, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Are you saying, Doctor, that Michigan is now producing non-existent saucers? <laughs> well, it's uh, one way of putting it, I suppose. But those who had witnessed the event knew what they had seen, and they didn't believe the theory handed to them by government officials. Van Horn, in sort of protest of this report, does his own soil report and finds things that are not normally in, in the soil, in, in the ark. And uh, it holds this up as proof that, you know, that something happened. Today we have Bud Van Horn. He's the civil defense director out in Hillsdale for Hills Hillsdale County. And he saw, has seen the UFOs. In fact, he's watched one last night. I wonder, do you uh, go along with the theory, of Mr. Van Horn, that it would be gas out there that caused it? Definitely not, Bob. Very definitely not. Mm -hmm. I have received very poor reception and be, have been made to look like a very uh, ignorant person. I remember the town was interesting because it was half, now nah, that couldn't have happened, disbelief, and the other half said, oh yeah. So that was kind of fun, but. <laughs> and those who participated in the investigation were equally divided. I'm not saying that there aren't things in the sky that we don't know about. What I am saying is that when there's anything that one doesn't know about, then the mind fills it with a great mass of fantasy. I've slowly come to the conclusion that there are such things as interplanetary spaceships. I'll have to stick my neck out and say that because I believe it at long last. It subsequently emerged that Heineck probably made this statement under some degree of pressure from the Air Force, which, under which Project Blue Book was housed. And even at the time, there was a degree of dissatisfaction with this as an explanation. And the, and the Hynek would later confess that this, there was some duress involved with this as an explanation. And I say this as an infamous explanation because it sort of traveled very widely in the UFO investigatory world as, as a sort of jokey catch-all, like, oh, it must have been a swamp gas. Heineck lied, and you can look up his lies because they're available in the Blue Book records. You can see, if you go to the congressional record, which I have done and I've um, summarized in my book, the Secretary of the Air Force lied. Everyone who, who, and they didn't know they were being lied to. I said here in this statement at the end that uh, I emphasize in conclusion that I cannot prove in a court of law that marsh gas is the full explanation of these sightings. But it does appear to me 
extremely likely. So there's just the things are put into this weird uh, twilight zone, if you will, that more or less have been stuck in since because there was there's never been any definitive proof offered that it was actually an extraterrestrial object. Because I think that's just a hard thing to prove. No one's really proved that about anything. Uh, but if you just talk to the students or you read the student accounts at the time, you're able to talk to anyone who witnessed it after the fact. It's just hard, they find it hard to, to reject the possibility that it was something that couldn't be explained. And that's just more or less people have been since. Uh, and that's that's where they've that's where they've stuck, and that's where the colleges have stuck to the extent people still think about it. You know something that I'd uh, like to talk with Major Kehoe about a little bit later, but I, I was intrigued by finding out that the Republican leader of the House, Senator Ford, has called uh, Representative Ford, isn't it? Is the Representative Senator yeah, Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, I don't know anyway. uh, but yeah, Republican leader, House Republican leader, has to be Representative of course. Gerald Ford called for a full-blown investigation of unidentified flying object sightings. This is something that Major Keogh has been talking about for quite a few years. If you go up to the Gerald Ford archives in uh, Ann Arbor, you can access, there are like, you know, cubic feet of letters written from people in Hillsdale, Dexter, Ann Arbor, essentially every town in uh, southern to southwestern Michigan, uh, sort of demanding answers. I mean, people really wanted to know what happened here. And uh, Gerald Ford, who was the um, who was a prominent House Republican at the time, took up the cause and said, you know, the people of Michigan want to know what happened. We need a congressional investigation of, of this sighting. The demand for answers grew so great that future U.S. President Gerald Ford became involved. The Michigan representative called for an in-depth investigation of the sightings and their possible explanations. But his call for action was ignored, and as the government became increasingly engaged in the Cold War, UFO sightings in the small Michigan town were forgotten. You know, people were sort of freaked out uh, about the idea that there could be something identified flying over American airspace. And so Ford called on either the Air Force, uh, who had sent Heineck down in the first place, to be more transparent, or, barring that, for Congress to do an investigation. And this was met widely with derision in the Washington Press Corps. I remember one reporter uh, referred to Michigan as the free martini before dinner state uh, because of all of these sightings. And the the congressman who represented Ann Arbor, where the first, you know, in whose district the first sighting happened, he took the opposite tack. He was a, uh, uh, he was, he was one of these uh, great society technocrats. And so his name's Wes Vivian. And so Vivian says, yeah, uh, Congress before, that's a really interesting idea that you have for uh, for Congress to investigate these so-called sightings. Uh, what if instead of that, we um, we passed it off to a research university? And that's what happened. Uh, I think the, uh, I want to say that the University of Colorado eventually got all of Project Blue Book's uh, papers, and, and that was kind of it. Uh, you know, Ford never got his investigation, and uh, and we never really learned the secret or the truth of uh, the sightings. To this day, the people of Hillsdale have never received a clear answer as to what they saw on that mysterious night in March 1966. The Hillsdale Dexter story became so famous for a number of reasons. One, it gave us the phrase swamp gas. It's funny, it's sarcastic, as you can tell. Uh, it says it all. It also gives a chance to come to grips with the fact that things are visiting us from off planet. And it's not something that's easy for people to come to grips with. So I think using that phrase swamp gas, kind of, you know, like <whistles> whistling in the dark past the, uh, a cemetery kind of thing. You had Heineck who was there. So you had all the, the key players um, and you had great witnesses. You know, hundreds of co-eds. Who doesn't like a story with co-eds from Hillsdale, right? 
Uh, you had people who stuck to the guns. You had the police. You had firemen. Uh, you know, you had politicians. Everybody, you know, okay, so a few of them, you might question their, their, their statements. But anyway, um, you had great witnesses. So all of that together just makes it an enduring story. not inclined to believe the swamp gas explanation. I do not think that any of the witnesses were lying. I think that they rationally interpreted and uh, reported things that they saw. I don't think that they were being misled by the, the their sort of senses, their sense impressions. But I just don't know what exactly it is that they did see. I, I, I find it difficult to hazard a guess because I mean, the, the explanation that would be the funnest to give would just change the nature of reality as we know it. And I am not prepared to do that in this documentary, at least not without a little more uh, evidence and research that, uh, than, uh, than what I've already done. So I'm. You know, I'm inclined to believe official explanations, uh, but this one is just, that's absurd. There, there has to be a swamp where there'll be swamp gas. Uh, what actually happened, I, I, you know, I think it's anyone's guess. Uh, an old friend of mine likes to say that anything involving the extraterrestrial more likely uh, involves the supernatural. I don't know if I'm ready to go there, though, but who knows? As far as I'm concerned, it's case closed. Flying saucers. The rest of us can emulate the scientists by keeping an open mind, since yesterday's fantasy sometimes turns into tomorrow's reality. But we might remember, too, that while fantasy improves science fiction, science is more often served by facts. This is Walter Ground Guide for CBS Reports. Good night. So Claire, do you think that there were aliens in the ARB? I don't have to think anything. I know that there were aliens in the ARB. It's often said that the simplest explanation is usually the true explanation. In this case, the specialists literally served it to us on a silver platter. It obviously was not aliens. We know aliens don't exist. It was definitely a government cover-up. At this point, it's not a matter of aliens. It's a matter of humans and what they said they saw that night. I don't know what was out there, but there has to be a rational explanation. We can agree that the swamp gas explanation was hokey at best, but there had to be something that makes this make sense. It's 1966. The Cold War is in full swing. Obviously, the government space program was testing new technology and something went awry. They got too close to civilization, i.e. Hillsdale College, and they had to cover it up. That's the simplest explanation, and it's the correct explanation. If there weren't aliens in the ARB, what did the Air Force track? What did Bud Van Horn find different in the soil than what was consistent in the ARB? None of it really adds up unless it's something else. And you gotta, you gotta be thinking about it at the same time that all of this is going on. Right? This isn't Santa Claus. This isn't the Tooth Fairy, right? People have thought that aliens have been around for years, you know? It would be odd, it would be out of place for us to be the anomaly, for us to be the only entity in the entire universe, in the entire galaxy. Why would it just be us? And why would no one ever make contact? It would make sense 
for something to have visited. Would it have made sense for something to visit Hillsdale College? I don't know, maybe, but it wasn't just here. It was also in Dexter. It was all over Michigan. It was kind of all over everywhere at this point in time. This is really when the UFO craze started and I think there's something to that. The government was even scrambling to keep up with the Dexter sightings that happened the night before the aliens were spotted in the ARB. The US government is obviously testing new technology for the space program. Hillsdale, Michigan, the perfect place. They saw something, something was there, but I don't think it was aliens. I ask you to read the accounts of Gidget Cohn from what she saw that night and not believe that there was something extraterrestrial up in the sky that night. At the end of the day, it's not really a matter of who's gonna go out there and who's gonna start looking, because it happened decades ago. There's not really all that much that we can uncover now, looking at it with modern scientific eyes. Um, and at the end of the day, I don't really think any of us should try to, because at least all of us working on the documentary would rather be live cowards than we would dead heroes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome up the Aliens and the Arb filmmakers. Come on up here, everybody. So as they're coming up, I did want to let you know that we have posters. If you want to um, get a poster, we'd be happy to uh, give you one of those, and I'm sure they'd be happy to assign them as well. Um, so if you want to come up afterwards, we'll have the posters up here. I also wanted to let you know, we're going to have just a real, real brief Q&A here. I want to get each of their uh, reflections on everything. But here at Hillsdale, um, they're about a lot of things, but really two things, pursuing truth and defending liberty. Last semester, we did the film on defending liberty. This was about pursuing truth, and that's exactly what they tried to do. So what I'd like to do right now is have each of the filmmakers come up here and just give us your uh, brief reflections on what it was like to make the film and any other conclusions you might have reached. So, Anna. Hello. First of all, I would like to thank Mr. Morehouse for um, teaching us. This would not have been possible without him. All the drone shots were Mr. Morehouse. Um, so we're extremely grateful. Um, so I think my biggest takeaway from this uh, project was there were so many interesting characters and they are what really made the story come alive. Um, I had the privilege of voicing Gidget Cohn's article and kind of being her voice uh, throughout this project. And she was this like epitome of this feisty journalist character. When J. Ellen Hynek came back, this is my favorite part of the story. She gets up, stands up and starts calling him out. She didn't wait for the Q&A. She just started kind of chewing him out right in front of everyone. Um, so I just think character accounts like that are really brilliant and make this story feel so real. You just pass it right down the line here. Hi, I'm Marianne Powers. Um, I had a really great time making this film. Um, I think one of uh, the most interesting parts about this was interviewing um, people who were there from the time. Um, I had the privilege of interviewing somebody who worked under um, Bud Van Horn at the funeral home, and um, he was able to share um, a little bit about just the hysteria that was going on in Hillsdale at the time and what it was like having CBS um, come and take over their funeral home. And um, we were able to sit and uh, talk about everything in the same room that Bud Van Horn was interviewed in um, when, when they came. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was one of the editors for this along with Elizabeth. Um, I think one of the more difficult things with this film was 
all the information we had and then trying to figure out how to boil that down to get a story that encapsulated, you know, um, all the evidence we had, but also keep it short, keep it interesting, um, but keep everything, like, relevant to that. So that was um, challenging to do that with all the interviews we had and all, you know, the information we were finding. Um, but it was a really cool experience. Something Mr. Morehouse said at the beginning of the semester that I was a little bit skeptical of, actually, was that you could use just your phone to make a documentary. And none of us had professional equipment besides the drone, which was provided by Mr. Morehouse. Um, and those drone shots were really great. Um, <laughs> but other than that, none of us had anything except for our computers and our phones, and we were able to make this whole movie, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, like Liz said, uh, we worked on some of the more like final editing of the whole movie, and one of my favorite parts was definitely just like looking through all of those interviews with Nick and Jack and going through all of the old um, footage with Walter Cronkite and just kind of like seeing all these different people come together to tell this one story of what happened um, just was really cool and all their different like takes on it and yeah I just thought it was really awesome. I think my biggest takeaway is seeing what an impact a story that was from the 60s could still have today and how many people are still so interested in it and also how easy it is um, to make a documentary in a short amount of time. I wish we could have had a year to make this, but we unfortunately didn't, but still it comes together and you don't need all the time in the world if you just do it. I think one of the coolest things about this class was just uncovering the amount of history that Hillsdale College has, because one of the goals um, was that all of our documentaries are gonna be you know, about Hillsdale because Hillsdale does have a lot of history and it's really just not documented that well. So I had an opportunity to talk to the archivist at Hillsdale who knew so much about so many different things. Um, and that's just not like common knowledge. Um, and so being able to like explore that and like uncover this very historical place that we get to study in was just very cool. Yeah, and going along with that, I also did a lot of the like Hillsdale's research from the archives and personal stories from Hillsdale's citizens. And there was just so much um, interesting random accounts of these stories or other little pieces of information that didn't necessarily fit in the final documentary, but all like just culminate in this crazy story that no one's ever heard of. So that was really cool to explore. Yeah, let's hear it for them. Thank you. So we did want to op open this up for questions. Uh, just one quick story. So we actually um, uh, went to the archives. Phoebe and, and Grace mentioned that we, we actually were able to go into the archives. And there's, there is some information in the archives about this incident, including a list of all the students who saw it. So we were uh, several of them, unfortunately, have passed away. But we got a list of the people who were still alive who saw this. We, had con we uh, got contact info for them, either emails or, or uh, phone numbers, and the students then individually started reaching out to all of them, and nobody wanted to talk about it. So Grace actually had one person. She had, uh, it's one of the people who lives in Michigan. She got her number. She was leaving messages, and the person wasn't calling us back. And I was going to be driving into that area. I said, well, you know, actually, I'll stop at the house and see if this, if this woman is there, the woman who lived in the dorm there. And... I went up and I knocked on her door and she opened it up. I'm not very, you know, happy to see whoever it was. So she looked and I told her who I was and I was from Hillsdale College. And I said, I was just wondering, my, my, I'm, I teach a documentary filmmaking class and my students are doing a documentary about the, the UFO sighting. And she just said, I got the message. I do not want to talk about that. So we don't know if the aliens got to her or... What the explanation was, but um, it was fascinating. Even the stuff that didn't make it on screen, there's a lot of fascinating stories like that as well. So does anyone have any questions, either about the film or about uh, the class or anything else that you saw tonight? Anyone have any questions at all? You can either come up to the microphone or if you just say your question, then I'll repeat it.
Did the students go to the Mitchell Research Center in the old Mitchell Library? Is that one of the places that we went? All right. Looks sounds like there might be some interesting information in there. All right. We have a sequel coming up then. That sounds great. Yes. The, the question was, yeah, Ray Shemansky was interviewed in there, uh, worked at Wright Air Force Base, and he, g he gave us uh, some of the video that we, um, uh, of, of one of the pilots that uh, had actually tracked the thing. So I think that probably goes to what Liz was saying is in there, was that um, we were trying to keep this as concise as possible. There was a lot of interesting information in there. This easily could have been probably a four or five part uh, series as well, because there is a whole lot of interesting informa uh, information out there, including all the stuff that Ray gave us, which we really did appreciate on that. So, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. People, the question is, did we find anyone who was projecting the Soviet Union as the possible explanation for that? Yep. Marianne, do you want to take that one? I would love to. We did not. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> we did not. We talked about that a little bit. Yes. So um, from my discussion um, uh, with the person who worked underneath uh, Bud Van Horn at the funeral home, he was convinced that um, the government was trying to cover up um, the space programs testing new technology, um, which would have been in competition with the Soviet Union. So working on new technology, um, they, he, he believed that you know, something was being tested out in a field and it got too close to Hillsdale College. And I certainly agree um, with that theory. Uh, but no, he did. He did not mention the Soviet Union being like exactly the person or the the cause. <laughs> did you have a theory about the Soviet Union? I might now. Okay, <laughs> she said I might now. Yes, yes. Question. The question is, uh, the people of the filmmakers who did the personality profiles, how are, they able, how are they able actually to capture those personalities and to get them on stage? So who wants to answer that one? Hi, Caleb. Thank you for your question. Um, that's a really good question. I think that what we were really looking for, at least what I was looking for, and I know Phoebe actually accompanied to do the Ray interview, um, we were looking for someone who could provide a lot of unique insight into the situation as well as the information. So when we're going through the archives, we're looking for people who have a specific point of view and are close to the situation, such as Gidget Cohn, Bud Van Horn, and then Ray, through his research and his own theories, his personality just came through. And really just giving um, our subjects like time to speak, they'll say what they end up wanting to say. Now, was your question also about the, the Hillsdale student profiles that we had as well? Okay. Uh, Phoebe and Grace, you and, and several of you guys, but you did some really cool ones. You want to answer that? Wait, can you clarify your question? Because I thought it was about, like, the UFO stuff. Okay, okay, no, I got you now. Um, yeah, so I, for the one that I did about Steven, um, I actually had like an hour of interview footage filled with like a bunch of stories um, from his travels. Um, and uh, so it was like really hard for me to do that because I saw so many aspects of his story that I really wanted to share. And so I could have made like, you know, a bunch of five minute documentaries on that. Um, but I think like, you just have to have a goal in mind when you go in for an interview, um, and you have to 
be willing to like ask questions that kind of like, okay, so you know, give me like a two minute summary of this event because then it'll keep you on track, but also like pull out, you know, the aspects of their personality that you're looking for and the aspects of the story that you're looking for because you really are trying to make um, a story and you're supposed to, you know, have, you know, a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, and so during interviews, you are really creating that story arc um, and that, that doesn't leave out the personality at all either because that's a very important part of it. Um, but you have to, you know, as an interviewer, be, be kind of like an author of that story arc as you go in. Yeah, I think part of it is also just that these people are really interesting. And both for me, Nate and James, had just so much to say because they were passionate about what they were talking about. And that made it really, really cool um, to film and then put together. I, unlike Phoebe, did not have tons and tons of footage because both of them knew exactly what they wanted to say about it and what they said was perfect for what I needed because they just, they're great. Okay, are there any other questions that anybody has? If, I'm sorry, one more question, okay? Did any of you have any unique or synchronous experiences as you were investigating this? Anybody want to take that one then? Grace? Okay. I, I don't know about unique or synchronous experiences necessarily, but there were just some things that were so interesting to find when we were doing research. Um, there was this one account that Phoebe and I found in the archives where this woman was... <laughs> She was, she was convinced that aliens had um, given her one of 18 bracelets to save her when the aliens decided to invade Earth. And um, one of the questions that she asked was if Jesus Christ had been born of a virgin because he was fathered by a spaceman. And those were really interesting to discover. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I think, like... Now that all of the information, especially that one, like that quote has come up so many times, it's just like a joke. Um, but uh, like while we were kind of researching for other documentaries, like names would pop up and you'd be like, oh, so like uh, I think it was the Palm Sunday Tornadoes. Like Van Horn was involved in the Palm Sunday Tornadoes along with uh, the UFOs. And so it's all kind of like lining up in a way. So yes, I would say there are some instances like that when you're doing research that's just like, oh, interesting. I know that person. Um, I will say, just super fast, that I feel like going into this, a lot of us were like, oh, UFOs, like whatever. It's totally swamp gas or whatever. But then after like going through all of that and doing all the research, I'm not going to say that it was a UFO. But like Nick was saying, like, in the interview, there has to be a swamp for there to be swamp gas. So <laughs> I think it's like just a kind of realizing like, oh, there's a lot more to this than I originally thought before I researched it, so. Very good. There's one more question. Okay, go ahead. Two questions, okay. The timeline between the first sighting and the primary sources? Yeah. Oh, I'd be happy to answer that one. Where, how does the documentary program overlap with the journalism program here? That, great question. Uh, journalists now need to have a lot of skills. 
They need to know how to write. They need to know how to speak. They need to know how to tell stories on video. So right now, Hillsdale is accomplishing all three of those right now. So if you're interested in the journalism program uh, at Hillsdale here, you now have the opportunity to uh, take classes in writing, in radio broadcasting, and in film now. So it's going to help create well-rounded journalists. Um, and Mr. Miller could probably, uh, I don't know, add to that or if I'm, if there's anything else I'm missing. Be happy to talk to you afterwards ab about that. Um, okay, and then does anyone want to uh, take the first question then? There. Can you repeat the first question? The timeline between how long was it in the news cycle? Who wants to take that one then? Elizabeth? Okay, I'm pretty sure. It started uh, with the first sighting in Dexter, and then the sighting in Hillsdale was a couple days after that. Um, I want to say almost a year, maybe longer, because J. Allen Hynek came back to Hillsdale a year later, um, and at that point, it was he came back because there was still news and, and still a ton of unanswered questions. So, yeah. Um, I can say, uh, just from my interview um, with the man at Van, uh, Bud Van Horn's funeral home, um, he said, like, being there during the time, after, like, a couple of weeks, um, the kind of excitement and talk on the town really started to die down, at least in Hillsdale. Um, so he said it was kind of like a spoof and then went away. But then to that end, the UFO ideas continued to persist both in Hillsdale and outside of it with um, the preschool mock, I think, is um, Mary Randall, that's right. It's next to mock, that's what I was thinking of. Um, but it's frequently called a UFO, and I think we showed a picture of a Hillsdale coloring book with the preschool and then um, a flying saucer above it, and then um, those tickets for the space flight around Central Hall were a few years after the sighting. So while it like died out in the overall excitement, there were definitely lingering pieces afterwards for a while. And that's on the scientific end of it too. Like I think it was a couple years later they were actually testing swamp gas. Um, where they like stuck a pipe into the ground and then tried and like lit the fumes on fire and it like created this little spark, but not nearly anything that would have, you know, created like three blazing lights in a circular motion that was like going up and down. And like they tested the boron levels from where the um, the UFO is said to have landed and boron is a, uh, a, what do you call it? It's an element, yeah. But like <laughs> in nuclear reactions, it's what's like, <laughs> put off, I suppose. They like use it in nuclear reactions and they have to get new boron, essentially, and dump the old stuff. There was an unnatural, um, exceedingly high amount of boron in the area where it was said to have founded, even um, years later. And boron's not a natural element to Michigan. Um, so there are just pieces of like scientific study like that where people have found the story and have kind of been you know, enthralled with it so much, they're like, I really need to know the answer. So it's, it was continuing, but the immediate craze did die out um, after, probably after the second, um, or after he returned to Hillsdale about a year later. As we said, we kind of scratched the surface in this film here. Uh, one of the things that they just briefly touched on there, in there was the hysteria in town after that. And there were also a lot of uh, local boys and maybe fraternity boys who were also involved in that week, they started shooting fireworks off. And there are people to this day who think that maybe they were the ones who were responsible for the initial UFO sighting on there. So Hillsdale was a crazy place that week there. Yes? One of the strangest things is that none of the girls want to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, in there. Yeah, and we, as I said, we, uh, we tried tracking down all the people who saw it um, and who, who were the actual witnesses there. And for whatever reason, they don't want to talk about that. I don't know if they're either tired of it or if they, people, they think people are going to think a certain way about them if they talk about it. But yeah, none of the, none of the witnesses. Uh, Gidget Cohn, unfortunately, passed away in 2009 because we would have loved to have her in this, the feisty student that Anna was talking about in there. Um, any other questions that anyone has about it? Yes. Well, 
What a phenomenal question. The question is, um, we have, we have uh, eight strong woman, women and one who's not here who worked on this film about some other very strong women who saw this UFO. And some of our students actually lived in the same dorm where this happened. Um, I also think it's really interesting that back in 1966, the dorm was called the New Women's Dorm. Hillsdale was not very clever about coming up with names for buildings back then. Oh, they got to work on that. Okay. Yeah, New Women's Dorm, though. So at least, yeah, now it has a, a it's named McIntyre. But, yeah, but some of our students actually lived in that dorm, and, and they were able to certainly put themselves in the shoes of that. But um, what anyone want to take that question? Do, did, does, did that inform it? Yep. So um, I actually lived on her hall. I think that because we are all women that worked on this documentary, I think there was um, an element going into this that we were maybe a little bit less inclined to believe explanations uh, dismissing these girls' testimonies as hysteria or just, oh, they're young women, they're scared. Hillsdale College accepts exceptional people. And I think that us being women, especially like myself, having lived in that dorm, we were more inclined to give them a little credit where it was due. Yeah, uh, he asked, um, how did we come up with the idea for this film? Uh, Mr. Morehouse came up or found the idea. I remember he mentioned it when during the screening of Defending Liberty. Um, but I think they handed me the microphone because I had the idea of um, incorporating some of us into the film, uh, like Marianne, AJ, uh, Josie, and Claire, um, who did a great job, really. Uh, <laughs> showcasing her personality. Um, and yeah, that was a lot of fun. We, f we were trying to figure out how could we make this more like the kind of Tiger King-esque documentaries, um, <laughs> which we actually had to watch for homework in this class. So another reason you should take this class. Um, and so we were trying to figure out how we can make it more, I guess, lively. And we figured we are the liveliest people we know. So we added ourselves. Yeah. So yeah, it, it was it was uh, uh, I first found out about the story because one of my students in the very first semester, Reagan Meyer, did a short film about this, and I'd never heard this story before. I'm learning all these stories for the first time. I'd never heard this story before. I go, this is fascinating. So uh, we kind of had you know every, every semester we talk about what is our next semester's big film going to be, and right now for those of you who are are either enrolled in the class or thinking about taking the class, we don't know yet what our next big project is going to be so we need to figure that one out but we just thought that you know we had with a, a better kind of glory we had kind of gone the ESPN route and done a great sports one then we went kind of Ken Burns PBS with the Civil War one and then like Mira said we decided to go Netflix Tiger King with uh, with this one here and this is the only class at Hillsdale College where you are required to watch Tiger King so it is cool for uh, uh, if, if for no other reason than that on there um, any other, one more question, okay. Question for Mira, do you believe there were aliens in the Arab? I tend to take more of the approach that it was probably a government, uh, something with the government. I, my closest guess is that the government was working on aircrafts that we weren't supposed to know about, one of them went haywire and ended up in the ARB, and they, there was never a solid uh, explanation for that. So I don't necessarily think it was aliens, but I don't think it couldn't have been aliens. One more question. Okay. Where, I'm sorry, right there. Yep.
Great question. As, essentially, why would a school like Hillsdale College do a documentary about this, besides the fact that we are about pursuing truth here? Anybody want to take that one? There. Go ahead, Josie. I can speak a little bit on the Sally Phillips interview I did. So she was the daughter of the current uh, Hillsdale, or the current at the time, Hillsdale president. Um, and she was a senior in high school when it happened. And I, it wasn't in here, but I got her perspective on what she believed had happened. And she was a student the next year as a freshman. And she was telling me about different stories where she believed that there were aliens in the sky in different instances over time where she'd be on the train tracks just looking up in the sky and she'd see lights flashing across and nothing to her was explainable except the fact that it must have been aliens. So at least for her, I know that she believes they were truly aliens, even though she didn't firsthand see this experience. Um, and I guess I would just uh, add to this to kind of get to the question you had about the socioeconomic range, maybe of people who spotted the, the UFO, then you had the, the Frank Manor and his son and Dexter, and then you had these, these women at Hillsdale. Um, they, that kind of did maybe span the, the, the educational uh, spectrum. Um, these women who saw, the, the, who saw this, whatever it was, in the dorm here, they were smart, strong, well-educated women who knew that they saw something there. And Gidget Cohn, as, as Anna said, I think was one of the best examples of it. I don't know where the auditorium at Hillsdale was at the time, back in 1966. Was it right here? It was on this, this site. But it was on this site, though? So how, how cool is that, that right here where we are right now, 56 years ago, or it would be 55 years ago, J. Allen Hynek came here, the researcher, and he tried to... Uh, talk this out over again. And Gidget Cohn, the student who saw it, called him out and said, you lied to us last year. You told us that we were crazy. You told us we saw swamp gas, and you didn't admit that that was right, not right. And, and that's exactly what he did. The fact that, that Hillsdale College students told this story about what happened 56 years ago at Hillsdale College and that we're sitting in the auditorium where part of that history was made, I just think is really cool. It's a really cool part of that. Yes, let's hear it for them.